In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about some oh-so-smelly anaerobic bacteria, as well as some very important potentially zoonotic organisms that as future veterinarians, you really need to be aware of. So the bacteria we're talking about today are grouped together in this lecture because they're non-spore forming anaerobes rather than that they're phylogenetically related to each other. We're going to be discussing a number of different genera, including Fusobacterium, Diclobacter, Prevotella, and just briefly mentioning Bacteroides for completeness. These are all gram-negative bacteria. And these four genera that I've just mentioned are all obligate anaerobes, so they really don't grow in the presence of oxygen. We associate these organisms with necrotic and suppurative conditions, so dead tissue with lots of pus, and infections where these organisms are present are oftentimes polymicrobial, so one or more anaerobes plus other bacteria all working together to cause the infection. Culturing these organisms in the lab requires potentially specialized skills. Um, some of them are incredibly fastidious and are easily killed with even a tiny hint of oxygen. Another feature of anaerobes is that they stink. They smell really, really terrible. And I thought that this paper kind of nicely summarized this in a way that maybe anyone can relate to. So in this study from Scientific Reports, they looked at children with halitosis and compared the microbial communities of their mouths. And what they found was that those kids who had the worst breath had a number of anaerobes, including Prevotella species. So this one here, you can see the red uh, bars on this histogram indicate those children who had halitosis and the blue bars indicate those who didn't. So the kids with bad breath had more of this Prevotella species than the kids who didn't have bad breath. Morphologically, the bacteria that we're discussing in today's lecture are all quite different. Uh, this is a pure culture of Fusobacterium necrophorum, and I think what you can appreciate is that these are long, slender, uh, pleomorphic, so variably sized and shaped gram-negative rods. Some are a little bit longer, some are a little bit shorter, some are very, very long and almost spindle-like. This is Diclobacter nodosus, another gram-negative rod, uh, much shorter than Fusobacterium, also a little bit plumper. It's kind of a shorter squat rod, and they're characterized by uh, the presence of these sort of bipolar swellings on either end. So it almost has like a dumbbell-like appearance. I think you can appreciate maybe on this one here. Um, the rods are also slightly curved. And then here we have Prevotella. Uh, these are gram-negative coccobacilli, so either very short gram-negative rods or uh, slightly elongated cocci. This particular culture is Prevotella melaninogenica. The non-spore-forming anaerobes are oftentimes a part of the normal microbiota. Fusobacterium lives in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, remember, anaerobes stink. Feces stinks, finding them in the gastrointestinal tract is really therefore not so surprising. Um, Fusobacterium is also commonly found in the rumen of cattle. So 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 colony forming units per gram of rumen contents um, of Fusobacterium have been demonstrated to be present. Diclobacter nodosus is a primary resident of the ruminant foot. And Prevotella species are found in the mouths of many different animals, including people, as I said. These are all opportunistic pathogens, and they become problematic when they both gain entry into a normally sterile site and when the tissue becomes ischemic. So we lose blood supply, we lose that oxygen that the red blood cells are carrying, it becomes anaerobic, and the bacteria are able to thrive and grow. When working with these organisms in the lab, growth on specialized media can be helpful for identification. Um, I'm not going through the normal sort of taxonomic uh, structure that I do with different biochemical tests that differentiate these organisms, because for you as future clinicians, the most important thing is to know that you have a non-spore forming anaerobe and the site of infection 
as opposed to the exact ID. That doesn't uh, play into the uh, uh, selection of therapeutics as much as it does for some of our other bacteria. So very generally speaking, if we have short gram-negative rods, maybe it's a Prevotella or a Diclobacter, long spindly gram-negative rods, uh, Fusobacterium species. These organisms can be identified by Malditoff for DNA sequencing. We don't know a lot about the specific virulence factors that many of these bacteria produce. Uh, a leukocidin has been identified in Fusobacterium necrophorum, which is active against bovine leukocytes, so bovine white blood cells, and is also toxic for hepatocytes. But what I think is actually more interesting is the descriptions that we have of how these organisms work together with each other. So Fusobacterium necrophorum commonly grows with either Truparella pyogenes or Diclobacter nodesis. And the way that this happens is that Fusobacterium causes tissue damage, it destroys leukocytes, and it facilitates deeper tissue invasion by the Truparella pyogenes or Diclobacter nodesis. Truparella then utilizes oxygen. This is not an anaerobic bacteria. So oxygen is used during its metabolism. It reduces the oxygen tension of the tissue and produces lactate, which Fusobacterium necrophorum can then use as a car carbon source. And Truparella also lyses erythrocytes, liberating iron that's oftentimes a, a growth-limiting nutrient. Diclobacter nodosis also produces growth factors used by Fusobacterium. There's a few specific virulence factors recognized for Diclobacter, including the presence of type 4 fimbrae, which are important for both motility and adherence, and then serine proteases. These are enzymes which the bacteria uses to degrade hoof proteins. As we'll see in the coming slides, Diclobacter is associated with foot rot in our ruminant species, and so breaking down that horn tissue is an important part of the pathogenesis. Fusobacterium necrophorum is associated with a wide variety of infections. In cattle, we see things like calf diphtheria or necrotic laryngitis, liver abscesses. You'll remember back to our Actinomycetales lecture where we uh, discussed the pathogenesis of liver infections with rumen acidosis followed by translocation from the rumen. Uh, Fusobacterium is one of those organisms. Interdigital necrobacillosis or foot rot and also metritis in dairy cattle. In sheep, it plays a role in foot ab abscesses. Diclobacter nodosis causes contagious foot rot in sheep and a variety of other interdigital infections in goats, cattle, and pigs. Prevotella and Porphyromonas species um, are both involved in interdigital necrobacillosis in cattle, so along with Fusobacterium. And in dogs and cats, these organisms play a role in periodontal disease. Bacteroides fragilis, um, I'm only mentioning for completeness sake. This is an important uh, anaerobic pathogen in people, but is less commonly identified in animals. So in cattle, Fusobacterium necrophorum is oftentimes associated with Truparella pyogenes. And like I mentioned, there's several common presentations that we see. One is calf diphtheria. So these are necrotic foci on the larynx, trachea, and buccal cavity of these animals. And these infections occur when we have some sort of abrasion within the mouth or some sort of damage. So you have rough feed, uh, something happens within uh, the mouth or throat that allows those organisms to get in and provide a portal of entry. We then see fever, depression, excessive salivation, and if you get close to these animals, there's a really foul smell. So remember, anaerobes stink. If left untreated, calf diphtheria progresses to a fatal pneumonia. Liver abscesses are commonly seen in uh, feedlot cattle. So this is that septic embolism following ruminitis. See our Actinomycetales lecture regarding Truparella pyogenes, or our Streptococcus lecture uh, for a description of Strep bovis and its involvement in rumen acidosis. And then finally, we also see it associated with metritis in dairy cows. Here you can see a larynx from a calf uh, with necrotic laryngitis. So this tissue over here, I think you can appreciate, is very abnormal looking. It's sort of uh, dry, it's friable. Um, surrounding it, there's a lot of in inflammation. Um, in this particular case, uh, this specimen comes from a calf who was given 
uh, fluids via an esophageal tube. And the owner reported that there was a lot of difficulty in placing the tube. And so when that tube was put down into that calf's esophagus, there may have been some trauma to the tissues, which resulted in both ischemic conditions, so decreased blood supply and decreased oxygen tension within the tissue, and also potentially some trauma, which allowed the fusobacterium to enter. In this image, you can see intradigital microbacillosis, otherwise known as foul of the foot, the colloquial name. Um, here we see fusobacterium uh, causing infections along with Truberella, Porphyromonas, or Dicobacter nodosus. Here you can see there's lesions uh, between the claw uh, that were visible following hoof trimming. So this uh, sort of ulcerative lesion down here. If we were to take samples from any of these infections and look at them cytologically, what you would see are, um, again, long, thin, gram-negative rods, but gram-negative rods which stain irregularly. So I think you can appreciate on this bacteria here, this one here, and particularly this guy down here, there's sort of stippling. There's these darker, um, darker stained regions of the cells. This is characteristic of fusobacterium. Dicobacter nodosus is one of the causes of contagious foot rot, so ovine digital dermatitis. Um, and this also oftentimes involves fusobacterium necrophorum. Uh, in affected sheep, we see lameness. So you can see this guy here reluctant to uh, place his right forelimb um, fully on the ground, doesn't want to bear weight on that. The primary reservoir of Dicobacter nodosus is infected sheep. So it's not something that really survives very well in the environment, um, although we can get transient contamination um, of, of highly trafficked areas. So places like trucks or paddocks, it will survive just long enough for another animal to come along and pick it up. But it's not something that is likely going to be spreading um, in a pasture, for instance. These infections are associated with warm and wet conditions. The way that we think this happens is that when sheep are in these warm and wet conditions, they get maceration of their interdigital skin. So that skin is actually quite delicate. And if you think about what your skin is like when you get out of the bathtub, you're sort of raisiny, um, it's, it's macerated and it's more susceptible to bacterial invasion. And that's exactly what happens. We get initial invasion by Fusobacterium necrophorum, it sets up superficial infections, causing inflammation. This allows Dicobacter nodosus to colonize and uh, propagate this infection. So proliferation of Dicobacter um, results in the production of proteases, um, which then further detaches the horn tissue uh, from the underlying uh, structures. This allows deeper invasion of the Fusobacterium, and the cycle continues and the infection worsens. I put a link above to a video of a veterinarian from the United Kingdom demonstrating what Dicobacter nodosus looks like in the field. Mm -hmm.